Thank you all for coming tonight. The lecture series is one of our most popular series, and this year it was sponsored by Richard and Robin McLean, who are right over here. So we thank them for their support of Los Alamos history and the Historical Society, and we thank all of you for being here. So tonight, I'm really excited. We have a local, but not only a local, but someone with a really deep history in New Mexico, and that is Christine St. Brain Fishes. And she has strong family ties to New Mexico that go back to the 1820s, when her fourth great uncle, Seran St. Brain, ventured from St. Louis, Missouri to Taos, New Mexico. Her great grandfather, James B. Jones, served as Lieutenant Governor of New Mexico from 1943 to 1947. Her great uncle was the playwright Preston St. Brain Jones, born in Albuquerque. So she has a long history here in New Mexico. She's a retired paralegal currently living in Los Alamos with her husband. She's a genealogist, a researcher, historian, writer, member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the New Mexico Genealogical Society, a board member of the Santa Fe Trail Association, and sits on the advisory board of the St. Brain Mill Preservation and Historical Foundation, which you're going to hear more about tonight. She has assisted with research on several books and articles, but she's currently working on her first book, From Trails to Triumph, which is the story of Saddam St. Brain and his extended family. So we're really excited she's here. And for those of you who are tuning in online, if you have to get away, it will be available on YouTube later. So um, I'm really happy that she's here tonight. Welcome. Thank you. It is so nice to see everyone tonight. Can you hear me OK? All right. I'm not sure if it's on. I think it's on. No, maybe it's not. There, try that. Hello. Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Well, good evening. My name is Christine St. Brain Fishes, and as a St. Brain family descendant and historian, I am delighted to be here with you. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the Los Alamos Historical Society for inviting me to speak with you. And I thank all of you who have taken the time to be here, whether in person or online. I also want to thank my extended family members who have been generous in providing information and photographs to make this presentation meaningful. This year, we are uh, commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail, and so what better way to acknowledge that anniversary than by getting to know someone who was so instrumental to the trail and who played a part in the development of the Southwest. In 1821, the Santa Fe Trail became America's first international commercial highway connecting the growing United States with newly independent Mexico through what today is Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico. The trail also had two branches called the Mountain Branch and the Cimarron Cutoff. The Mountain Branch provided more reliable access to rivers and springs, but was about 100 miles longer than the Cimarron Cutoff. The shorter Cimarron cutoff was the favorite route in the early days of the trail, but grass for the animals was in short supply and water was scarce. You were taking a risk if you took this shorter route, and it was even called the Ornado del Muerto, or Journey of Death. Nevertheless, all manner of merchandise would be transported to the Mexican province of New Mexico, and silver, gold, wool, and mules would return to Missouri. The famous commerce of the prairies developed and grew until the railroad reached Santa Fe in 1880. The trail was a route of conquest during the war with Mexico in 1846 to 1848, was the scene of significant civil war actions in 1861 to 1865, and was in the middle of the Indian Wars of the 1860s and 70s. 
It provided a path for the settlement and change of the territory of the Louisiana Purchase. Considered the most important commercial route across the Great Plains during the 19th century, the trail brought together a diverse mix of cultural groups. Now for those of you who are not familiar with me, I am a retired paralegal, having worked in that field for about 25 years, but I have always loved history. And I grew up listening to stories about various members of my family and reading the genealogy booklet that Paul St. Vrain, my great great uncle, wrote in 1943, an original of which was given to my great grandmother, Maud St. Vrain. I would spend hours poring over the names inside and wondering about these people and their lives. And so it's no surprise that I became an amateur genealogist myself in 1999. Yes, my family has a long history in New Mexico, beginning with Saron St. Vrain, my fourth great uncle, who first arrived in Taos in 1824 from St. Louis, Missouri, and my three times great grandmother, a Sioux Native American who came to New Mexico around 1850 and lived in Mora, New Mexico for 10 years before moving to Colorado with her second husband. Also, Benedict St. Vrain, a nephew of Saron from Missouri, who joined him in New Mexico in the late 1860s. But yes, there is also my great-grandfather, James Brooks Jones, who was Lieutenant Governor of New Mexico under Governor John Dempsey from 1943 to 47, and who married Maud St. Vrain. Along with my great-uncles, James Jr., a Bataan Death March survivor, the playwright, Preston St. Vrain Jones, and my grandmother and mother, all of whom were born in Albuquerque. Now, I'm pretty sure I was conceived in Roswell. But seriously though, when my grandparents moved briefly to Roswell, my mother fell for a young man from the New Mexico Military Institute. He joined the army, and when he was stationed back east, I found myself born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My parents divorced when I was two, so my mother and I headed back to New Mexico for a time. Well, after living in various states and the country of Germany, I chose to live in Santa Fe for 16 years, my longest stretch anywhere, and now have lived in Los Alamos for 10 years with my husband, Chris. I'm delighted to say that my daughter, my son and his wife, and my two grandsons also live here. Well, since my early retirement, things have stayed quite busy. I am a former first vice regent and chapter regent of the Stephen Watts Carney chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution in Santa Fe, and a current member of the Taos Mountain chapter, DAR. I also served as state recording secretary for the New Mexico State Organization, DAR. I am a board member with the Santa Fe Trail Association and co-chair for their publications committee and belong to two of their New Mexico chapters and one Colorado chapter. As publications co-chair, I created the website santafetrail200.org. This was to help promote events. I am a member of the New Mexico Genealogical Society and am also on the advisory board of the St. Vrain Mill Preservation and Historical Foundation in Mora. I have assisted with and written a few published articles and essays, but am currently working on my first book, a biography of Saron St. Vrain entitled From Trails to Triumph. His story will be told from a familial perspective and will include chapters about various members of his family and others who made an impact on his life. Now history is often written as people choose to remember it depending on which side of an issue they stand on. Researchers are able to do some digging around and sometimes find that the facts can be a little bit different. Yes, Saron St. Vrain has made it into some history books for his business ventures, and a few who knew him personally wrote a bit about his character. This presentation, however, is designed to bring to life the man, Saron St. Vrain, just who he was, the circumstances that led him to travel the Santa Fe Trail, and his legacy here in New Mexico. Saron St. Vrain, is New Mexico true? The New Mexico Tourism Department has given me permission to use this phrase for my presentation, but 
What really is New Mexico true? Some define it as being authentic and true in its people, landscape, and culture. So why do I include Saran in this? Because he is a northern New Mexico pioneer and leader of his time. Born in the Missouri Territory on May 5, 1802, to an aristocratic family displaced by the French Revolution, Saran helped introduce the leadership and entrepreneurship of a still budding America to the New Mexico Territory as a mountain man, merchant, politician, and statesman. Those who personally knew him said he was kind, worthy, sensible, respectful, a commander, a gentleman, polite but frank, good-natured, intelligent, and he was busy. As a mountain man, he was trapping along the Mexico trade route as early as 1824 before moving on to focus on trading. His success as a trader helped solidify the Santa Fe Trail Route. As a frontiersman, he helped create the castle on the plains known as Ben's Fort. David Lavender, in his book entitled Ben's Fort, says, quote, the Indian trade transplanted by Bent, St. Vrain, and company to the Arkansas River filled the vacuum of the Central Plains, irrevocably tied the Southwest to St. Louis, and so helped prepare the way for the final influx that would make the nation whole, end quote. While today he is recognized and honored more in Colorado, probably due in part to the forts he was responsible for, along with his large land grant, he made New Mexico his home for 45 years, having stores and homes in the plazas of Taos, Las Vegas, Mora, and Santa Fe, grist mills in Taos, Talpa, and Mora, lumber mills, distilleries, and for a time was even editor of the Santa Fe Gazette newspaper. Although several papers had been established in Santa Fe prior to the Santa Fe Gazette, none were as successful. He was an entrepreneur with the ability to stay ahead of the times. He was instrumental during the Taos Revolt of 1847 and in addition to other military endeavors, also served briefly in the 1st New Mexico Cavalry, rising to the rank of Colonel in 1861. In 2009, the Santa Fe Trail Association would remember Saran for his significant contributions to the Santa Fe Trail by inducting him into their Hall of Fame. Saran's birth and those of his siblings represented the first generation on their father's side to be born in America. Saran was a son, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, and would come to be a husband, father, and grandfather. However, how did it come to pass that he would leave his family behind in Missouri, travel the Santa Fe Trail to Taos, New Mexico, and decide to make his home in the Southwest? To fully understand the depth of this man requires a comprehensive examination of the boy, Saran. How he was raised, what values and morals were passed on to him, and how his influential family members impressed upon him the need to honor his heritage. Yes, he was of French origin, born in French-influenced St. Louis County in Missouri Territory, and was bilingual, speaking both French and English. In fact, his family has a long history in France, dating back to the 12th century with a knight by the name of Robert de Sancy. It is interesting, if not confusing, how surnames were altered based upon acquired land considered to be aristocratic. Back then, as families acquired estates, they often adjusted their surname accordingly. Thus, when the family acquired the estate of de Hulp and the estate of de la Sue, their surname was changed. However, when Saran's grandparents fled France in 1790 for America, there is an indication of yet another name on this passport. Saran's paternal grandfather, Pierre Charles de Hulp de la Sue de Lusier, was a counselor to King Louis XVI, and amongst his various titles was hereditary mayor of Bouchon and treasurer of the province of Hainaut. Well, sometime before 1778, King Louis XVI bestowed upon Pierre Charles the title of Marquis and granted him the right to purchase the estate of de Lusier. And Pierre Charles quite proudly added this to his name. 
And since it would have been considered a hereditary name and title, only Pierre Charles and his wife would come to use it. This collection of aristocratic surnames ended along with the French monarchy and nobility, and none of their five children would carry it on. A question I am often asked, though, is, OK, but where did the Saint Vrain name come from? The Saint Vrain name seems to pop up in America out of the blue, and there is often curiosity about its origin. Actually, it is a very old name, and family records in France indicate that in the 1500s, Saran's sixth great-grandfather, Gerard de Halp, was the administrator of the Saint Vrain Abbey. Generations later, Saran's father, Jacques, desiring for business purposes to distinguish himself from his older brother, Charles, added Saint Vrain to his name. Afterward, Jacques' children, including Saran, dropped the previous moniker of de Halp de la Sue. But for generations in France, the de Halt de la Sue family exhibited a readiness to undertake challenges and were busy promoting farming, importing and exporting trade goods, mining, and developing reliable water navigation in their locality. These were not frivolous, work-shy nobles. Indeed, the motto on the family coat of arms supports this tradition of diligent enterprise. Nul bien sans pien, translated literally as, no good without pain. It has also been loosely translated as, nothing worthwhile without effort, something my immediate family has always used. The family's dedication to the improvements of their community earned them a reputation of trustworthiness with the town folk who would come to the aid of the family at a most crucial moment. A life in France under service for the monarchy certainly would have provided Saran St. Vrain with a different lifestyle. For example, his grandfather Pierre Charles was given an extraordinary opportunity involving an audience with the king which left a lasting impression. In 1786, King Louis XVI recognized Pierre Charles with honor when His Majesty personally inducted him into the Royal Order of Saint Michel, the first chivalric order founded in 1469 by King Louis XI. Saran's grandfather and great-grandfather were devout monarchists known all their lives for loyalty to their kings. And while circumstances changed, loyalty would be a dominant quality passed on to younger generations. But as tensions grew and violence erupted in France, Saran's grandparents became troubled. The storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789, which Pierre Charles and his wife Domatil could have witnessed from the apartment they lived in while in Paris, led this family patriarch to seek a way out of France. But how could Pierre Charles obtain a passport for his family when aristocrats and nobles were under threat of death? Even though the French National Assembly abolished hereditary nobility in July 1790, the newly elected mayor of Valenciennes issued the family a passport to leave on August 8, 1790, revealing that Pierre Charles still held stature in the community. The mayor simply crossed out the previous royal municipal official's name on the form, signed it, and sent them on their way. Soon after that, if not the same day, Pierre Charles successfully set sail from Le Havre with his family and entourage to America. Had he waited even one more year, perhaps even months, the passport may not have been forthcoming. Not everyone listed on the passport sailed at this time, and not everyone came to America. Making the journey with Pierre Charles were his wife, Domitille Josepha, daughter, Jean Felicity Odell, son, Philippe Francoise Camille, and several servants. The oldest son, Pierre Joseph Domitille, never came to America, choosing instead to flee to Germany until things calmed down in France. And although Saran's father, Jacques, was included in the original passport, he and his older brother, Charles, both employed in the military, would arrive a few years later. Life was not easy for the family on their arrival to America, and not just because they were used to a super comfortable lifestyle. Before they could even disembark from the ship, Pierre Charles was presented with a bill for excess baggage fees. 
one of them, one of the items being a harp belonging to his daughter. After so many generations accumulating material goods and raising the status of the family, we can imagine how difficult it would have been to suddenly have to liquidate and determine what could and could not be brought with them. The baggage fees were paid, but the family struggled in their new country with culture shock and a host of other bombardments, illnesses, and setbacks. However, the most shocking event for Saran's grandfather upon arrival to America was the discovery that he had been duped. Having realized that French revolutionary upheaval would negatively affect him, he had purchased 2,000 acres of land in Ohio from the Scioto Land Company through their agent in France. This company fraudulently issued worthless deeds to many French colonists, causing conflict, confusion, and distress. After a quick regrouping in Pittsburgh and the unexpected additional expenditure of family funds, Pierre Charles built a house along the Monongahela River. They had escaped the guillotine and death in France and seemed content to live their lives now safe in America. However, that ambitious spirit so prevalent in his blood would prompt Pierre Charles to uproot again to a town he and others founded in 1793 called New Bourbon near St. Genevieve in what was then Spanish-controlled Illinois. The Baron Francisco Louis Hector de Carondelet, born in France, had entered Spanish military service in 1762. In 1791, Carondelet, as the appointed governor of the Spanish colonies of Louisiana and West Florida, granted Pierre Charles, a childhood friend, permission to form the settlement of New Bourbon and populate it with French immigrants. Pierre Charles had grand plans for the community, although those plans would never be fully realized. Nevertheless, the family roots in America would begin to take hold and spread across their new continent. This silhouette of the Marquis de Lusier, Saran's grandfather, is the only known likeness we have found so far. As this slide demonstrates, he had a great many responsibilities. It is understandable that Pierre Charles brought with him the same mindset for community involvement that he had exercised in France, another quality that he passed on to younger generations. And this is a picture which was hand-drawn by Saran's uncle, Charles de Halt de la Sue, depicting the family estate in France that was left behind when they came to America in 1790. It is gratefully preserved now at the Missouri History Museum in St. Louis. Like other cultures, family stories and philosophies of life in France would be handed down to those finding themselves born in America, including Saran. Saran's uncle Charles de Halt de la Sue did not travel with his parents to America, but came later in 1794 like a good son to help them out. Charles also left a detailed diary of some of his travels and visits with family members for which we are indebted. In 1782, at the age of 18, Charles had become a cadet in the Spanish military. It was very common for noble sons to serve in the military, and Charles escaped the upheavals of uh, France in France by joining the Spanish military service for King Carlos III. In 1799, under orders from Spain, Don Carlos was appointed Lieutenant Governor and Commander in Chief of Upper Louisiana, which area included the states now known as Missouri and Illinois. He was the last Spanish Lieutenant Governor and was responsible for turning over control of the territory to American agent Amos Stoddard when Louisiana was transferred to the United States in 1804 as part of the Louisiana Purchase. This slide show, shows us a picture of one of the transfer documents signed by Lieutenant Governor de la Sue, Captain Amos Stoddard, and Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark fame. On what is now the Gateway Arch grounds in St. Louis, officials gathered at Government House. Later, a ceremony followed with the lowering and raising of the Spanish, French, and American flags. Saran was almost two years old at the time and very likely in attendance with his mother and father, older brothers Charles and Felix, older sister Odell Felicity, and baby sister Elizabeth. 
On a side note, I was corresponding with different people in 2003 and received news that a 200th anniversary celebration commemorating the Louisiana Purchase was going to be held in St. Louis on March 14, 2004. I rallied some of the family together and we held a small reunion in conjunction with this event. I attended with my mother and my daughter Krista. It was our first time in St. Louis and we were thrilled to be walking where our French ancestors had once so often walked. Specially minted nickels were prepared and distributed during the event and we even got to share a beer with Charlie Clark, a descendant of William Clark who loves to dress up and reenact his ancestor. The National Park set aside space on the steps of the arch for our family overlooking the Mississippi River, and we even had a young descendant sing during the ceremony. That young lady is now an accomplished opera performer named Devon Guthrie, and you may have seen her perform at the Santa Fe Opera. As mentioned, Saran's father Jacques was included in the family's 1790 passport, but did not actually arrive in America until 1793. He had been an officer in the French Navy, commander of the King's Galley, and captain of militia. Obviously, he needed to find new employment. In Missouri, he was given various employments at St. Louis under family friend Baron de Carondelet, including the command of a vessel on the Mississippi. For his successful service, he was awarded a land grant. He would come to make his home at Spanish Lake in St. Louis County, married Marie Felicity Chauvet du Briel, and came to hold many investments and land claims, including a uranium mine, oh, I mean a lead mine. <clears throat> However, for Jacques, speculating on land deals and lead mines was just that, speculation, and he needed to find stable income to provide for his growing family. In 1810, he opened the first production brewery in St. Louis, with partner Victor Hobb, a German immigrant with a recipe. Unfortunately, fire destroyed the brewery around 1813, along with Jacques' hopes of becoming a beer baron. But just think, instead of a Budweiser, you could have been enjoying a St. Brainer all this time. It wasn't meant to be, but does illustrate the diversity in business that Saran would come to imitate. Now, Saran's aunt, Jean Felicity Odell, who went by the name Odell, did travel with her parents to America along with family friend Pierre Durbigny, whom she married soon after arrival. Durbigny would become the fifth governor of Louisiana and Odell the first lady. Odell was very close with her family and wrote them many letters in French, especially to her mother and brother Charles, who both would come to live with her off and on through the years. Saran's uncle, Philippe Francois Camille, also traveled on the same family passport and since he spoke English, often acted as interpreter for his parents. He settled in St. Genevieve and married Mary Matilda Villars in 1802. In July 1806, he was appointed one of the justices of the peace and of the common pleas for the district of St. Genevieve, Missouri, but unfortunately died six years later in 1812 at the age of 33. But I will mention something about his eldest daughter, Odelle de la Sue, Saran's first cousin a bit later on. Well, a young Saran was surrounded by these and other family members who demonstrated to him that they were thinkers and doers, hardworking and loyal, and he would model himself after them. He learned that while life was not always a smooth trail, it would serve him favorably to keep a firm belief in the family's motto that with effort, worthwhile things could be possible. Saran was raised in a bustling household with nine siblings born between 1797 and 1815. This chart represents Saran's immediate family, his father Jacques, his mother Marie Felicity, and their 10 children total. Well, historians are familiar with the fact that Saran's father died when Saran was still a boy but few have commented on the totality of losses and change experienced by a young boy. His father's passing was not Saran's first brush with death. His paternal grandparents had died in 1806 and his uncle Camille had died in 1812. 
But then in 1817, when Saran was 15 years old, his younger sisters, Elizabeth and Carolyn, died at the ages of 14 and 13. Their deaths could have been attributed to malaria. However, that would not have lessened the impact of their loss. Their absence from the home would have been felt at every moment. A mere eight months later in 1818, his father Jacques passed away suddenly at the age of 48. And 10 months after that, in 1819, Saran's older sister, Odell Felicity, passed away at the age of 18. These years gave the family a constant barrage of funerals, unwanted changes, and depression. The eldest son, Charles, had married four months prior to his father's death, and Felix would marry in 1822. But in 1818, Marie Felicity St. Vrain, a grieving widow and bereaved mother, Having watched her family being whittled away, still had six children at home she was responsible for, with the youngest, Marcellin, a three-year-old toddler. The sale of the land grants Jacques had acquired sustained the family for a while. Along with extended family members and longtime friends, Saran's mother did her best. However, she made a very fortuitous move when she arranged for 16-year-old Saran to apprentice under good friend Bernard Pratt a noted fur trader. Pratt was a distinctive and wealthy French leader in Missouri, along with John Baptiste Lucas and Auguste Chateau. Pratt and Chateau would become dominant figures in the Missouri fur trade. This slide depicts an identification chart from an engraving on a banknote issued in 1817. The house you see circled is identified as the home of Bernard Pratt and would have been where Saran lived during his apprenticeship years. A closer look at the surrounding houses reveals that Saran was enveloped in the environment of fur trading merchants with names such as Pierre and Auguste Chateau, Manuel Lisa and Bartholomew Berthold. Later, John Jacob Astor would enter the picture with his American Fur Company and in 1827, Bernard, Pratt, and company became their St. Louis agent. Saran's older brothers, Charles and Felix, who were actually very close to him, may have persuaded him to join with them in their own business ventures in Illinois. At age 29, Charles had moved from the St. Vrain family home further north to Galena, Illinois, with his wife Eulalie, their daughters, and infant son, where Charles, among other endeavors, spent a few years as a county election judge. The actual lure may have been lead mines, which were very prevalent in the area. Eventually, however, he became a United States Indian agent for the Winnebago's. Upon admission to the Union in 1818, Kaskaskia became the capital of Illinois and saw its largest population of Anglos from various descents. Brother Felix settled in Kaskaskia and by 1825 owned a steam sawmill and welcomed his second daughter into the world. Felix was also the quartermaster of the 2nd Regiment, Illinois Militia, a Randolph County commissioner elected in 1828 and public administrator for the county. In the book, The History of Joe Davies County, Illinois, it says that the discovery of lead in the area attracted settlers to work in the mines and that a Mr. LeBaum and Felix St. Vrain built a smelting furnace and opened the first store together in what became known as the Apple River Settlement in present-day Elizabeth, Illinois. Eventually, Felix, too, would become a United States Indian agent for the Winnebago, Sauk, and Foxes. In addition, their younger brother, Savinian St. Vrain, after completing his education, followed his brothers to Illinois where in 1830 he married Virginia Menard. The Menards were a very prominent family. Savinian worked as a store clerk for his brother, but would later come to hold public office as treasurer, assessor, and sheriff in Kaskaskia. With these brothers gainfully employed, they seemed set to raise their families in the context of Illinois pioneers. Whatever influence his brothers may have used to convince Saran to join them there, he did not do so preferring to continue to learn all he could about the fur trade and enticing prospects in the Southwest. Now, some say it doesn't matter who our forefathers were. It is who we ourselves are. But I say 
It is our forefathers' experiences and mindsets that are passed on and influence the decisions we make for the better or for the worse. As we have seen, Saran may have felt the pressure of filling the boots of his ancestors and influential relatives, but for him there would be no titles or land to inherit, no fortune to be passed down. He would be determined to earn his own way in the growing country which was his home. Like so many young men of that time, Saran looked west. As long as Spain held New Mexico, attempts by American trappers and traders to harvest the furs of the southern Rockies were thwarted. With the exception of David Merriweather, who was trading among Pawnees when he was lured to Santa Fe by tales of gold and silver, no other American broke Spain's commercial monopoly over New Mexico before 1821. Mexican independence would change that situation. Someone who undoubtedly inspired Saran to embark down the Santa Fe Trail was William Becknell. The year was 1821, the first year of Mexican independence from Spain and the first year of legal trade with New Mexico. William Becknell would be the first American trader ever to enter Santa Fe without being arrested and jailed. Becknell's first trip to Santa Fe was so profitable that he decided not only to make another trip, but also to transport his goods in wagons. This decision led to his title, Father of the Santa Fe Trail. Working as a clerk in Bernard Pratt's store in Missouri, a young Saran was influenced by the exciting tales of profit to be made by those like William Becknell and Jedediah Smith, and he wanted in on the action. He met Becknell in the spring of 1823 and with a 21-year-old's enthusiasm and stamina, helped supervise the work of delivering merchandise to the traders. He also acted as their agent in hiring some of the 81 men who accompanied the caravan of wagons that Becknell organized and which Bernard Pratt supplied at least part of. For Saran, Missouri was home, but it represented substantial personal and monetary losses, and he saw only two options ahead of him. Stay in Missouri, working as a clerk for $20 a month, perhaps moving into a type of general manager position, but always someone else's foot soldier, or head out west, where a man could make a name for himself and saddlebags seemed waiting to be filled with silver. In the fall of 1823, Saran could not contain himself any longer. He formed a partnership with Francoise Giron and with supplies on credit provided by Bernard Pratt, a kiss goodbye to his mother, and a pat on the head to eight-year-old Marcellin, they made their own start on the Santa Fe Trail. The expansion westward offered opportunity and adventure to the young, unattached men of the time, and that suited Saran. During the boom years of the fur trade, Hundreds of thousands of dollars in furs, principally beaver, would be taken out of the Rocky Mountains. It was about March 1824 when Saran crossed the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and saw below him the Valley of Don Fernando, later called Taos. Previously thought to have arrived in Taos in 1825, this handwritten letter from Saran to Bernard Pratt and located in the Chateau collection at the Missouri History Museum is evidence that he arrived in 1824 after a long and troublesome voyage of five months that began in October 1823. In 1825, a homesick Saran wrote his mother gloomily that it was a miserable place. Nevertheless, he could foresee an opportunity for business and made his headquarters in Taos. During this time, the Taos Pueblo Indians came to respect Saran for fair trade dealings and nicknamed him Blackbeard. Saran was setting the standard for fair but profitable trading and put into practice all that he had learned from Bernard Pratt. Ultimately, New Mexico would become Saran's home for the next 45 years. Saran did not sit around moping for his old home for long, but returned to Missouri in order to obtain more supplies and organize a trapping expedition of about 100 men to the Gila, near present-day Silver City. In early 1826, then-Governor Antonio Narbona, a Spanish soldier from former Spanish Louisiana, 
issued a passport for Saran and his party to pass from Taos to the state of Sonora for private trade. And Saran would become multilingual, learning the Spanish language. Saran was successfully following in the footsteps of his ancestors as a diversified entrepreneur in possession of the ability to stay ahead of the times. Moreover, although he had left Missouri behind, he never selfishly forgot his family. As an example, his letters of April 1825 and September 1830 to Bernard Pratt included instructions that certain stock animals be delivered to the farm where his mother and siblings were living. Mules especially were a valued commodity. Indeed, he would care for his mother, siblings, nieces, nephews, and cousins throughout his life. While on a trip back to Taos in 1826, he had a companion known as one of the great trail makers of the West, Ewing Young. Together, they made plans for widespread trapping expeditions along the borders of Mexico that helped build the commercial route between New Mexico and Missouri. Saran evidently found time for romance as well, for in 1827, his first son, Vicente, was born in Taos. Now, remember Saran's uncle Camille, who passed away in 1812? His eldest daughter, named Odell de la Sue, married Bernard Pratt's eldest son, Silvestre, in 1822. This is significant because while historians have documented Saran's working relationship with the Pratt family, I like to point out that the families were also connected by marriage. Sylvester Pratt is the one who unfortunately died while leading the 1827 Green River fur trapping expedition at the headwaters of the North Platte near present day North Park in central Colorado, evidently bitten by a rabid animal. He is said to have died a swift but painful death, leaving Odell a widow and Saran in charge of the expedition at the age of 25. Saran was very shaken by Silvestre's death because Silvestre had been more than just a boss to him. They grew up together in St. Louis, with Silvestre being about three years older, and he knew that his cousin Odell would now be a young widow. Combining that with having to tell Bernard Pratt that his eldest son died, well, it was a heavy burden for a young man. On another note, this was the same expedition where trapper Tom Smith was shot in the leg with an arrow, and with the aid of Milton's sublet and a good dose of Taos lightning, the leg was amputated. Later, Tom whittled his own wooden leg and would be known thereafter as Peg Leg Smith. Well, the bonds created between men as they lived, worked, and battled their way from east to west proved to be unbreakable and timeless. In September 1830 in Taos, Saran and Charles Bent negotiated an agreement of partnership that was one of the longest lived and most successful in the history of the Southwest. About a year later, William Bent joined the venture and the threesome worked closely together as Bent, St. Vrain, and Company. The partnership led to the construction of Bent's Fort on the mountain branch of the Santa Fe Trail located near present-day La Junta, Colorado. The fort, often referred to as the Castle on the Plains, was built about 1832 and became very important in the company's expanding trade empire along with Fort St. Vrain to the north and Fort Adobe to the south, as well as the company's stores in New Mexico at Taos and Santa Fe. Soon, younger brothers George Bent and Marcel and St. Vrain joined the company in management positions. They all planned to capitalize on the manufacturing, transportation, and trade of goods from St. Louis to Santa Fe. Travelers on the Santa Fe Trail would stop here for supplies, wagon repair, livestock, good food and water, as well as rest and company. The fort took on a young Richens Lacey or Uncle Dick Wooten Christopher Kit Carson and others to serve as hunters at a dollar a day. Telling an interviewer of Charles Bent and Saran St. Vrain, Kit said, quote, their equals were never in the mountains, end quote. Theirs would turn out to be lifelong friendships. Although called a fort, it was not a military fort. Rather, it was a trading post. 
Southern Cheyenne, Arapaho Indians, and trappers would come to the fort to trade goods. It was the only major permanent white settlement on the Santa Fe Trail between the Mississippi River and Mexico. Meanwhile, things were beginning to get troublesome for Saran's older brothers in Illinois. This slide shows a transcribed letter from Felix St. Vrain to William Clark in May 1831, describing the current state of affairs in the area. At the time, William Clark was the superintendent of the St. Louis Indian Agency. The letter reveals an aspect of Felix's personality in that he preferred to treaty with the Indians rather than use military force. The influx of white settlers from Europe and the Eastern United States impacted the Native Americans just as it had in other states and territories, and the government utilized Indian agents like Felix and Charles to manage affairs with the tribes. From the book Bent's Fort, David Lavender writes of the St. Vrain brothers as follows, quote, while Saran had been in New Mexico, his older brothers Charles and Felix St. Vrain had gone into the Indian trade on the Mississippi. There they had won respect. When Thomas Forsyth had resigned in 1830 as agent to the Sox and Foxes, Felix had been appointed his successor. And Charles St. Vrain worked with his brother as agriculturist and as interpreter for Governor Reynolds during the tense negotiations with Black Hawk's angry tribe." End quote. Felix was stationed at Fort Armstrong, Illinois when the Black Hawk War began in 1832, while at this same time, the Bent St. Vrain Company was finalizing plans for Bent's Fort in Colorado Territory. In May 1832, while on a mission to deliver dispatches under orders from General Atkinson, Felix and other members of his party were ambushed and murdered by a band of pro sock Winnebago Indians. Felix's murder was particularly atrocious. The Indians, after killing and scalping three of his companions, cut off the head, hands, and feet of Felix. But they did not stop there. They cut out his heart, cut it up, and passed it in pieces to the braves to eat. This became known as the St. Vrain Massacre. At least one account reports that the butchering started <coughs> before Felix was dead. In the Missouri History Museum, there is an Indian motif pillowcase that bears a small amount of blood. It is an item that Felix was carrying with him when he was murdered. And I will add that it was very moving to see this in person. I remain very grateful to the staff at the Missouri History Museum who brought this item and others out for me to see and photograph. And this slide shows information stored at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., related to the report of Felix's death by a party of Black Hawk's band. The manner of his death was utterly devastating to the close-knit St. Vrain family, and Saran's mother never fully recovered from it. She was in a painful state of despondency, telling her brother-in-law, Charles de Halt de la Sue, quote, as you see me, I desire only death. End quote. For a time, though, as bitter as it must have been, Charles continued as an interpreter and was among the group who took the chief Black Hawk and some of his braves to Washington, D.C. in April 1833. But there were signs that Charles remained despondent over the death of his younger brother, and he reportedly died from an alcohol-related illness in 1834 at the age of 37, according to the diary of Charles de Halt de la Sue, leaving behind a widow and young children. It's not clear where Charles is buried, but Felix has a headstone located at the Kellogg's Grove Monument. It is interesting that it would be William Bent who would carry the news of Felix's death to Saran at Bent's Fort. His brothers remained close to Saran's heart and as evidenced by his last will and testament, he provided for, quote, the heirs of my two brothers deceased, Charles and Felix St. Vrain, end quote. Well, Saran continued to make many trips back and forth to Missouri to take care of business and visit with family. As evidenced by his will, this included the children of Charles and Felix. But while trapping and trading continued, around 1831, Saran had applied for and received Mexican citizenship in order to facilitate his trading. This caused him to sometimes be known as Saran Sambrano. 
Charles Bent began to make more of the trips to St. Louis. William Bent oversaw activities at Bent's Fort, while Saran ran the company's stores in Taos and Santa Fe. Saran even served as the American consul to Mexico from 1834 to 1838. Now this slide shows a map of Taos during the years 1845 to 1875, and you can see where Saran's home was located on the lower right of the screen. Across the plaza is where the St. Vrain Inn and store was located. Today, it is the location of the La Fonda Hotel, where I'm sure many of you have been or visited. Now, many people have expressed an interest in Saran's direct descendants, so I've included some additional information in this presentation. Legacies, after all, are more than buildings or statues left behind to commemorate someone, and Saran would embrace the New Mexico territory and marry local women at least three times, producing heirs. All of Saran's marriages were considered common law relationships. His first spouse was Maria Dolores Luna, who was nine years younger than Saran, and their son, Vicente, was born in 1827 during the height of Saran's trapping adventures. But in 1828, records show that Maria Dolores had married another man, Jose Sandoval. But she died about 1839 when Vicente was 12 years old, and Vicente would come to work closely with his father. In Saran's will, Vicente was named guardian for Saran's youngest daughter, Felicitas. Vicente married, but died without issue in 1876. He is believed to be buried in the St. Vrain Family Cemetery in Mora, but there is no headstone or documentation to confirm that. There is also no known photograph of him. Saran's second spouse was Maria Ignacia Trujillo, and they had three living children together, born between 1844 and 1847, Felix, Isabelita, and Marcelino. You can recognize some of the common St. Vrain names beginning to be used for these children. If the 1850 federal census is correct, Maria Ignacia was 23 years younger than Saran. Saran's third wife was Maria Luisa Branch, whose mother was the sister of Saran's first wife, making Maria Luisa the niece of his first wife. In addition, Maria Luisa was 33 years younger than Saran, and they would have one daughter in 1863, rather late in Saran's life, Felicitas. Now, daughter Isabelita married Pedro Jose Gomez, and they had four children. Saran would become a grandfather in 1865 with Isabelita's firstborn, a daughter named Teodora. Many descendants trace their lineage to Saran through Isabelita. A few years ago, I was able to find the headstones of Isabelita and Pedro Gomez. They are buried in the St. Vrain Cemetery of Huerfano County, Colorado on a private ranch surrounded by beautiful views of the Spanish peaks. Now, most families have at least one child that gives them cause for concern, and for Saran, it was his son Felix. Felix was named after his uncle Felix, who was killed in the Black Hawk War. Despite being raised in what became a wealthy and influential family, Felix had problems. He was addicted to aguardiente, a generic term for alcoholic beverages that generally rated between 76 and 108 proof. The trappers used to say it was strong enough to grow hair on the hide of a chihuahua and made one feel as if they'd been struck by lightning. Well, sadly, Felix attempted suicide several times, and Saran was desperate to help his son. He arranged for a friend to take Felix away from the drinking environment, and this helped. Felix eventually settled down and married, settled in Huerfano County, Colorado, which was part of the Vigil St. Vrain land grant, and had a son whom he named Vicente. This Vicente also had no natural children, but did adopt a cousin, Manuel James Garcia. As a side note, on this slide, you can see that Pedro Gomez signed this homestead deed as a witness, evidencing that the families were well connected with each other in homesteading the area. 
Felix is buried in the same cemetery as his sister Isabelita, and Manuel James Garcia St. Vrain is also buried there. It is difficult to fully understand the relationship between Saran and Maria Ignacio Trujillo. They never appear on any census records together, but in the 1850 census, their three children do have the St. Vrain surname. Now, some have suggested that Saran's common law relationships overlapped each other, so perhaps jealousy was a factor. A further indicator of a falling out is with Saran's son, Marcelino who in adulthood adopted his mother's surname and went by Marcelino Trujillo. A descendant told me that all she knew was that Marcelino did not want an Anglo surname. However, like his brother Felix, he homesteaded on land that was part of the Vigil St. Vrain land grant. And he does appear in records to have married and raised several children, thereby adding to more descendants of Saran. And this is a picture of Saran's third wife, Maria Luisa Branch St. Vrain. This picture was kindly shared by a family descendant. And this is a picture of Felicitas with her first cousin, Luisa. I want to thank uh, cousin Danny Martinez who provided me with this picture. It's one that I had not previously had the pleasure of seeing before, and I'm very grateful. Felicitas was about 14 or 15 when she married Macario Gallegos, who reportedly had already been waiting years for her to come of age so he could marry her. Well, they are a handsome couple. Felicitas and Macario had a son, <clears throat> Arturito Saran, who died in infancy and is buried in the family cemetery in Mora, to the left of Grandfather Saran. In addition, they had an infant daughter, Emilia, buried in front of Grandfather Saran, but with her headstone missing. Their son, Jose Vicente, married but died of a kidney infection in Texas. He did not have any children. Their son, Frank Arthur, married and had three sons. Descendants are numerous in Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and elsewhere. Well, in between romancing the women and producing children, Saran's business ambitions were just as unceasing. Janet Lecomte wrote that, quote, in the fall of 1842, Bent St. Vrain and Company built a log post in the Texas Panhandle on the south fork of the Canadian River for the Comanche and Kiowa. The post was popular with the Indians and profitable for the company. In later years, the ruins of the adobe post were known as adobe walls and became the site of two Indian fights, both celebrated in numerous True West stories as the Battle of Adobe Walls." End quote. Fort St. Vrain, north of Denver, was a scaled down version of Bent's Fort and during the years 1837 to 1846 was actively involved in transactions with the Indians primarily for buffalo hides and fur products. Marcel and St. Vrain, Saran's youngest brother and my third great-grandfather, joined his brother out west in 1835 at about the age of 19. He proved himself capable and in 1838, at age 22, was put in charge of the smaller but strategically located fort. Marcelin was the baby of the family and only three years old when his father Jacques died. Understandably, he was very close to his mother. However, she was known to have deep bouts of depression over her losses, and this impacted Marcelin. At times, he acted out and was quite the rowdy boy in school as he socialized with St. Louis's gentry. Although Marcelin was earning very good grades at St. Louis College, funds became depleted, and he was unable to finish. Still, this formal education would have uh, benefited him when he joined his older brother out west, a decision that his mother would have approved of with the thought that older brother Saran would be a positive and instructive influence in the business world. In 1841, Charles Bent wrote that about 1,500 Comanche lodges were expected at Bent's Fort along with equal amounts of Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Sioux. Connections by marriage with Native Americans became a common practice to encourage peaceful relations. And Marcellin soon found himself wed to a young Sioux named Spotted Fawn, also called Red and Royal Red, a sister, she claimed, of Red Cloud. 
I had a photograph made of a tin type of red that was kindly given to me by my cousin Carol Beard from Colorado. I still am in awe that she gave it to me, and I count it among the greatest treasures I have ever possessed. However, it is unlikely that this union brought much joy to Marcellin's mother, who never got over her son Felix's brutal murder by Indians. There is no heartwarming story of Marcellin bringing his Indian wife and mixed blood children to Missouri to meet his mother. While these unions were acceptable in the West, they were still socially unacceptable back East. Marcellin did well for a while, and he and Royal Red had four children, all born at Fort St. Vrain. The first was an infant who lived only a few days. Next was a son, Felix, yes, another one, who never married and died of smallpox in a Union Army prison in Vicksburg in 1863. Another son, Charles, would become my great-great-grandfather. Their youngest child, daughter Mary Louise, would come to marry General E.B. Sopras. As a side note, in 1911, the Colorado Centennial State Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution placed a permanent marker at the site of Fort St. Vrain. It is a granite stone that credits Saron St. Vrain with the construction of the fort. My great-great-aunt Mary Louise St. Vrain Sopras, the daughter of Marcellin and Royal Red, who had been born at the fort, was an honored guest at the unveiling ceremony. Amazingly, 100 years later, in September 2011, I was invited to participate in a rededication and restoration celebration of that very monument. I met with Weld County Commissioners, Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Platteville Historical Society for the ceremonies. To prevent vandalism, a wrought iron fence was placed around the original marker and new signage was installed. Well, back in 1843, Saran, Observing that the profits from the fur trade were diminishing, partnered with Cornelio V. Hill, a prominent Taos trader and former mayor of Taos, to make land investments. Together in 1844, Mexico granted them the V. Hill St. Vrain land grant that spread across southeastern Colorado. For nearly 300 years, Spain's governance in the Southwest had created the assumption of land ownership with its inherent rights of legal transfer of sale. When Mexico obtained its independence from Spain in 1821, that government assumed the role of property owner and also bestowed large tracts of land to willing settlers in the form of ranchers, millers, farmers, timber operators, general store owners, and more. Those newcomers, however, were often viewed as unwelcome squatters on land already occupied by residents. The Vigil St. Vrain land grant was huge, about four million acres, and it appeared Saran would be a land baron, possibly more significantly than his forebears. As part of the terms for receiving the grant, he put together plans to develop the area and, as mentioned, sent his son Felix, among others, to live in the area known as the Huerfano. However, the land grant was later disputed and Congress reduced it to 97,000 acres. Legal battles have raged for years over rightful ownership of this land. Saran's mother, Marie Felicity, died in 1845. There are no surviving headstones for either of Saran's parents. He referred to her as my dear mother in his letters, and having watched her suffer from depression for so many years and doing the best he could to support her, he could say now that she had found her peace. He spent his life grateful to her for steering him to Bernard Pratt, yet he still had no desire to return to living in Missouri. Instead, he would lend a helping hand to family members who were willing to join him out west, such as his brother Marcellin and his nephew Benedict. Meanwhile, with the Mexican-American War impending, Saran and Charles Bent rushed to Missouri for supplies, on their way stopping at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where Colonel Stephen Watts Kearney was stationed. During their visit, they supplied the Army with information about the New Mexico Territory and its influential people. On May 13, 1846, Congress declared war on Mexico, and Colonel Kearney, with his Army of the West, 
was sent forth. Bent's fort was to be the rendezvous, and by late July, the 1,700 troops were there. They marched south across Raton Pass to Las Vegas, and on August 18, 1846, entered Santa Fe, which had already been abandoned by Governor Manuel Armijo. Thus began the American occupation, and it had seemed relatively easy. Colonel Kearney left a small garrison in Santa Fe, appointed Charles Bent as first American territorial governor, and left for California. That winter found Saran managing the company's stores while Charles managed the fledgling government. The Colorado forts were managed by William Bent and Saran's younger brother, Marcellin. The Taos Revolt of 1847 would be known as an insurrection by Mexicans and Pueblo allies furious about the United States occupation of present-day northern New Mexico upon conclusion of the Mexican-American War. While people wanted merchandise from St. Louis, they resented the American occupation and being cut off from Mexico. Some were afraid of losing their land, and many did. Although Saran had embraced New Mexico as his home and had longtime business acquaintances, family, and friends, he was still regarded suspiciously as an outsider by the discontented. When Charles Bent, as the first governor of New Mexico Territory under American rule, was subsequently scalped alive and killed at his home in Taos on January 19, 1847, his longtime friend and partner, Saran St. Vrain, recruited 65 volunteers in Santa Fe, known as the Avengers who joined 300 U.S. troops to crush the uprising. The Avengers included many prominent names, both Hispanic and Anglo. For Saran, who was appointed captain of the volunteers, this was very personal. In addition to the murder of his longtime partner, Charles Bent, his land grant partner, Cornelio Vigil, was also killed. Saran himself was nearly killed in some of the close quarter fighting Manuel Chavez came to his rescue, as did Uncle Dick Wooten. During the height of the conflict, the Avengers encountered the enemy ringleader, Pablo Chavez, wearing Charles Bent's blood-stained coat and shirt, and Saran immediately shot him. Mountain man and trapper Uncle Dick Wooten, who helped put down the rebellion, noted the feelings at the time. Quote, the friendships of the mountain men were warm friendships. We had never seen the time when we were not ready to attempt the rescue of a friend whose life was in danger, and it was seldom indeed that the killing or wounding of one of our number had gone unavenged. Among those who had been so brutally murdered were men who had been my warmest and best friends ever since I came to the country, and I felt that I should, if possible, do something towards securing punishment of their murderers." End quote. Saran would go on to become an interpreter during the trials of the remaining rebel leaders. This picture shows Saran's rifle, called Silver Heels, which is presently located at the Glorietta Gun History Museum, owned by Jim Gordon. I particularly like the description, 33 and a half inch barrel, heavy use. By the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on May 30, 1848, New Mexico became part of the United States, and in December, the people of New Mexico petitioned Congress for organization of a territorial government. In September 1849, Saran was sent as a representative from Taos County to the Territorial Convention to help frame a territorial form of government. But due in part to his reputation of honesty and fairness in his dealings, Saran's role in politics never fully blossomed. However, he again perceived that times were changing and he did what he did best, he diversified. He built the first modern grist mill in Taos around 1850. The mill he constructed near the village of Talpa, a few miles south of Taos, used grain from the Taos Valley, the principal breadbasket of New Mexico. A second wooden mill was erected at Mora and drew wheat from settlements east of the mountains. A third mill was constructed at Peralta. All three mills were powered by water. 
Now records indicate that Saran supplied the military with grain as early as 1851 to support Colonel Sumner's planned military outposts near Taos. He was one of the largest New Mexico suppliers and contracted to support a variety of military sites throughout New Mexico, especially Fort Union. During the early 1860s, military contracts were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars due to the need to strengthen New Mexico's military as a result of the Civil War and to supply the 6,000 Navajos held at the Bosque Redondo. Saran supplied both wheat flour and cornmeal to Fort Sumner and the Bosque Redondo Reservation. These lucrative military contracts helped Saran become the first self-made millionaire in New Mexico. He presented himself for initiation as a Freemason on March 22, 1853, receiving his degrees in Montezuma Lodge No. 109 of the jurisdiction of Missouri at Santa Fe. Saran's service in the military, however, did not end with the Mexican War. In 1855, he assumed command of a volunteer company in addition with regular troops and Indian scouts from Taos Pueblo, now no longer enemies, in a largely successful punitive operation against raiding Hickoria Apaches and Utes. He served as Lieutenant Colonel under Colonel Thomas Fauntleroy with Kit Carson as Chief of Scouts. Further showing Saran's diversification, this document shows his appointment as postmaster to Fort Union in 1856. Saran demitted himself from the Freemason Montezuma Lodge in 1860 and together with fellow Freemason brothers Kit Carson, Peter Joseph, Ferdinand Maxwell, John Francisco, A.S. Ferris, and others, they formed a lodge at Taos under a charter from the Grand Lodge of Missouri. The lodge would be known as Bent Lodge No. 204 in honor of their deceased longtime friend and business partner, Charles Bent. In 1861, with the smell of war in the air, there was something of a social revolution underway in the territory. The promise of a monthly military salary and lucrative bounty was a powerful incentive for hundreds of the poor and indentured servants of New Mexico. To meet the Confederate threat to New Mexico, Brigadier General Canby agreed that Saran seemed the logical person to command the 1st New Mexico Infantry because of his political and economic influence in the territory. Kit Carson was his lieutenant colonel. It was a volunteer infantry which was to rendezvous at Fort Union and would later be joined by General Carlton and his California volunteers. But abruptly on September 17, 1861, after he had taken a leave of absence, Saran resigned, saying that a multiplicity of private business was preventing him from devoting full attention to his military duties. He was 59 years old at this time, and some say he was experiencing ill health. And that could be. However, if true, it did not prevent him from courting Louisa Branch, whom he married and produced a daughter with in 1863. Well, 52-year-old Kit Carson took over command of the 1st New Mexico Infantry and under orders from General Carlton and others, became remembered in history books for campaigns against the Native Americans. Saran, however, never seemed to cease from activity. With the end of the Civil War, his flower contracts with the government dissolved and Saran turned to focusing on distillery operations and lumber supply. During this time, he also became the federal auditor for the territory with the unenviable task of implementing an income tax. Saran was patriotic though, and here is a fun fact from 1861. The stars and stripes had flown from a short flagpole in the plaza since 1846 but Civil War Southern sympathizers kept tearing it down. Taking a group of men to Taos Canyon, Captain Simpson selected a tall, slender cottonwood, trimmed it, and carried it back to the plaza. Crooked but sturdy, it made a suitable flagpole. With the help of Kit Carson, Saran St. Vrain, Thomas Boggs, and others, the flag was nailed to the pole and raised aloft. Captain Simpson spread the word around the plaza that anyone who dared to molest the flag would be shot down. 
Then the group retired to the Bent and St. Vrain store, taking turns standing guard. The flag stayed up and, since it had been nailed to the cottonwood, flew day and night. When military officials in Santa Fe learned of the courageous act, they permitted Taos to fly their flag 24 hours a day. While not a law, Congress did grant permission to fly the Taos Plaza flag 24 hours a day to commemorate this event. Well, in addition to welcoming his daughter Felicitas into the world in 1863, Saran foresaw the need for a road between Taos and Santa Fe. Sending a memorial to President Lincoln, signed by himself and 138 others, he effectively laid forth the feasibility of such a project, stating that an appropriation of $100,000 would be sufficient. The memorial was successful, and although Saran would not live to see it done, the road was open to travel in the summer of 1877. Today, everyone who drives from the point of Embudo to Taos is driving on the road that Saran initiated. At the age of 65, Saran finally retired from his long career as an entrepreneur and territorial powerhouse and chose to reside at his home in Mora near his 40-year-old son Vicente and four-year-old daughter Felicitas. He now had the chance to sit back on the porch and reflect on what he had done with his life, how far he had come, how he had made a difference for his family and friends, content in the knowledge he had always given his best. On October 28, 1870, he suffered a stroke and died at the age of 68. Over 2,000 people attended his funeral in Mora, the most in New Mexico history to that date, many of them officers from Fort Union. He was given a burial with full military honor. His fellow Freemason brothers provided the headstone, and years later, when it was vandalized, they kindly replaced it. His obituary in the Daily New Mexican stated that, quote, in every part of the territory, there are men who will feel that in the death of Colonel St. Vrain, not only has the country lost one of its best citizens, but they have also lost one of their truest and noblest personal friends, end quote. Saran's second stone mill in Mora was the largest and best built of all his mills, which may explain why it still stands today, a material testimony to his legacy. Frank Trambley purchased the mill in 1912 and operated it until his death in 1922. The mill was never operated as such after that. In 1973, the mill was added to the National Register of Historic Places, and in 2002, it was added to the list of 10 most endangered historical places in New Mexico. The mill remained in the Trambley family until 1990, when it was sold to Michael Montoya. The St. Vrain Mill Preservation and Historical Foundation, established in 2013, purchased the mill from Mr. Montoya in May 2015, with the goal of restoring it to a shared community center. In June 2015, I was invited to say a few words at the ribbon cutting ceremony, but I didn't know I was going to get to help cut the ribbon. I represented the St. Vrain family and Frank Trambley represented the Trambley family. It really was a very memorable day. Another very special day involved the presentation of a prestigious award to the St. Vrain Mill Foundation by the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. This award recognizes an individual or group that has done recent remarkable volunteer work at the community level in areas of historic preservation. I was delighted to present this award to some of the board members of the foundation on November 19th, 2016 for their efforts to save and repurpose the St. Vrain Mill in Mora. The reason the foundation deserved the award is that since the purchase in 2015, the mill's foundation has been stabilized, the gables were repaired with a grant from the New Mexico Historic Preservation Division, the windows were replaced through an Adopt-A-Window fundraiser, and the loading platform has been rebuilt. The rear door and steps were repaired this year courtesy of a matching grant from the National Society, DAR, and as the picture reflects, 
we were quite happy to attend a Santa Fe Trail chapter meeting conducted at the mill where the announcement was made of the successful completion of the work. In addition, the inside stairs to the second floor have also been repaired through a fundraising campaign. Now, while the mill was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1973, it wasn't until 2020 that a plaque was added to the building. The president of the St. Vrain Mill Foundation and I split the cost of the plaque and enjoyed another fun day at the mill during its installation. Currently, a stronger stone-by-stone -stone fundraiser pro is in progress to raise funds for a matching grant to repair the east and west walls of the mill. More information about this preservation effort can be found online at stvrainmill.org or in the trifold brochure available for those in attendance. The St. Vrain Family Cemetery, where Saran is buried, along with others, is currently the focus of another project of ours. We are there now to remove the brush and other overgrowth in order to allow for a ground-penetrating radar survey to determine all of the burials there. This is necessary because several of the headstones were unfortunately vandalized, not just Saran's, and it is impossible to know exactly who is buried where. But with the survey, we will be able to mark all the plots where people have been buried. We will also erect a marker at the entrance gate as well. Today, the Southwest is dotted with numerous descendants of Saran St. Vrain, a truly living, breathing testament to the man. Over the years, I've had the distinct pleasure of meeting some of them in person. Most recently, while at the St. Vrain Mill, I met cousins Frank Gallegos, a descendant of Saran's youngest daughter, Felicitas, and Alfred Buster Chavez and his son, Antonio, descendants of Saran's son, Marcelino. Mora, Mora, New Mexico possesses two standing testimonies to Saran, a beautiful headstone marking his burial place and his enduring gristmill. Eugene Hanisch wrote, quote, it is tragic to think that such a famous man who gave so much to the development of New Mexico and of Mora lies forgotten and unhonored, end quote. And Mark Simmons wrote, quote, everyone who knew him including Kit Carson, had a great respect for him. Saran St. Vrain was a very sober individual and very solid. Unfortunately, history, especially the history of the frontier West, is more likely to remember the yarn spinners, the hell raisers, and the gunfighters than it is to remember solid citizens." End quote. Well, every generation produces men and women who inspire us. Saran's noble grandfather, who had good intentions but never fully recovered from his losses in France, died in relative obscurity in 1806, coincidentally at the age of 68 years old. Perhaps he passed on to Saran his adventurous and ambitious spirit, and with it, his grandson was able to contribute to a form of American legacy for which his direct and indirect descendants would always remember and be proud. Paul Augustus St. Vrain, son of Marcel and St. Vrain, and a nephew of Saran, really said it best. There may have been other members of the family to have been in public life. However, I like to think that taken by and large, we are law-abiding, good, average citizens of the best country on earth. I do hope that a deeper understanding of who Saran St. Vrain was and what he meant to New Mexico has been imparted. Thank you and I am very honored to have been with you here tonight. Wow, there's a lot of work that went into that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing your family story and keeping that history alive. Um, I would encourage everyone to discover and record and share your own family stories. I think it's really important. That's how we keep history alive. So without the stories, there's no history. Are there any questions? I don't know, she covered so much. <laughs> the, um, the Mill and Mora, we were talking at dinner, and it's, it's going to be turned into a community center, which is a really nice 
idea for a building that large. So I'm really excited, having been in Mora, that that's going to be coming to that community. I think that'll be a real benefit to that whole little community up there if you haven't been to Mora. But no questions? Okay, well we're gonna hang out here. If you wanna come and chat with us, you feel more than welcome. Thank you all for coming.